um, it is great pleasure to host um, Thomas Sebacek and Christine Felber on the question of um, whether our economy serves the common good. Um, and I quickly um, introduce myself. I'm Clemens Erlinger. I'm a member of the Cambridge, um, uh, uh, Cambridge Society of Economic Pluralism's um, uh, committee. I'm responsible for um, all the media, so I'm responsible for the media. Um, and it is a great, um, great um, pleasure that all came, of course. Um, I'll quickly um, introduce the speakers. Um, and give a few words on the economy of um, for the common good um, before we um, will have uh, the first speaker on. And um, at the end, there will be about 20 to 30 minutes for questions. Um, I must remind you though that, um, as there might be many questions that uh, uh, for, for which there's an int interest, um, it would be great if we could keep them brief and precise. Um, if necessary, we'll have to cut you off, unfortunately. Um, let, great. Let me introduce you to the speakers next. Um, Christian Felber is um, an Austrian um, author, university lecturer, and speaker. Um, he's been featured in uh, Financial Times, um, The Guardian, and many other um, newspapers. Um, his most um, successful book um, is The Economy for the Common Good, um, which has been translated into many languages. It was originally written in German, um, and it is um, a book which we are discussing tonight as well. Um, it proposes a new economic system um, that is basically focus, focusing on aligning economic activity um, with um, ethical values. So it, what, it, what its central aim is, is to um, reorganize um, the way we think of economics as not just um, sort of fulfilling um, uh, spreadsheets, um, economic spreadsheets, um, but very much aligning um, our economic activity with, um, with what, what, we, what we care about um, in, in, in ethical terms. Um, he will um, be our first speaker, um, and he will talk um, for about 20 minutes about the economy um, for the good as a movement um, that has been gaining international traction. Um, and he will be uh, followed by Thomas Sefercek, um, uh, who is uh, a Czech uh, economist um, and the person who left, um, as I might not mention. Um, <laughs> we get often confused. <laughs> Sometimes considered as twin brothers, even. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they do have. Um, <laughs> but I'm a little bit more funny. <laughs> <laughs> and a little bit more fair. <laughs> yes, fair enough. <laughs> um, Thomas has been um, uh, studying economics um, at uh, both the um, University of Prague um, and in Copenhagen, and he has been a fellow um, at uh, um, Mary Fellow at uh, Yale University um, on the other side of the river. Um, he has been um, uh, noted internationally for his um, best selling book, The Economy of Good and Evil. Um, which has been translated into 17 languages um, and has been published in this country by Oxford University Press. Um, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, he did offer it to Cambridge Press. He did mention Cambridge Press. He, he offered it to Cambridge University Press first, but they um, did respond. Um, for some reason. That's what we, that's what we invited him today. Um, and he will be responding um, to, to Christian um, and will be giving a sort of more broad outlook on. Uh, on some of the failings of our current economy <coughs> and um, how he thinks the uh, economic product of good is uh, referencing to that. Um, and without further ado, I think I will um, give the stage to Christian Felber. Um, and yeah, please uh, have me invite from the game. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to Cambridge University. I'm very delighted to present a possible alternative system, an alternative model on the economy in 20 minutes. That's why I'm asking right away if there is a need for a different economic order. There are two services. One is global and between 60 and more than 80% of global citizens say that uh, the present economic model is not enough at the service of the planet and the society as a whole. This is from Accenture with 40,000 uh, citizens. And a more precise uh, and representative poll by the Bertelsmann Foundation, which is um, in the heart of the establishment in Germany, which was even repeated twice. Uh, the outcome was that 88% of the Germans and even 90% of the Austrians are asking for a new economic order in these literal terms. Uh, I don't uh, go deeper into the reasons because I would like to present you alternatives. In Great Britain, there was a very famous lady that, saw, that said once, there is no alternative, um, Margaret Tina Thatcher. 
And the answer from the global civil society is there are many alternatives. There are tapas, means there are plenty of alternatives, as delicious as Spanish tapas. And uh, the economy for the common good is just one of them. Economy for the common good is one of the youngest alternatives. Five years ago, there was nothing of this idea and nothing of the movement. Although it is based, as Clemens already introduced, on, I would say, even timeless universal values that always were broadly shared by the people in all cultures uh, of this planet. But it's not only a theoretical or scientific model, it's as well a very alive <coughs> movement supported by thousands of citizens and companies and municipalities and universities, as I will tell you in the last part. And thirdly, we have developed a democratic pathway of implementation. As in 25 years of political engagement, I have drawn the lesson that it's not enough to have even the most beautiful idea and alternative, which is even supported by a broad majority of the citizens, if governments and parliaments don't like it. I start with the model, and maybe I add that I'm not an economist, and maybe that's necessary. Uh, I'm teaching economics and alternative economics since 10 years at uh, Vienna University for Economics and Business, but I did not study it because the horizon of economic thought was a bit too narrow um, to my needs. I actually wanted to study universal sciences and uh, was very surprised uh, when I knocked at the door of universities in Austria and Germany. They said, oh, you're wrong, my friend. And I said, well, how can I be wrong at universities with my wish to uh, study universal scientists? That's in your name. Ah, you refer to our name. Well, that just comes from universitas, and universitas just refers to the union of teachers and students or of researchers and teachers. And then I answered, but do you know where universitas comes from? In the universitas, there is a smaller word, the big universe. And the big universe in literal uh, Latin terms means unum versum, one single verse. One poem is the literal meaning of universe at least one coherent wholeness. And this is what universities, by their names, promise to teach or to offer. And if I wanted to study exactly that, and uh, I was just frustrated by these institutions. And that's why I tried to get by myself, in an autodidactic way, a holistic uh, view on the world and also on the economy, and studied some other different um, disciplines, uh, but 10 years ago, the Vien Vienna University for Economics and Business asked me to teach this holistic approach to the economy at their house, and I'm very uh, delighted uh, with this invitation. Uh, in this holistic view, the economy is, is re-embedded or embedded in its broader context. No more divorce between the economy and ethics, no more divorce between the economy and feelings, no more divorce between the economy and democracy and no more divorce between the economy and nature. One example, the economic science is one of the youngest ones. Maybe uh, you know that uh, the first chair for economics at this university, it was only established in the 20th century. And the most famous economist of all, uh, Adam Smith, by his formation, he was not an economist. He could not be an economist by then because the economic science as such didn't exist by then. He was a philosopher and even a moral philosopher. And then in the, in the mid of the 20th century, an Austrian humorist uh, made a joke. He, he reported that a student came running to him and, and uh, was very excited and uh, was almost screaming, Mr. Krauss, Mr. Krauss, what shall I study? And Mr. Krauss' answer was, well, calm down, listen to your heart, what does it tell you? And the student tried to calm down and, well, if I, yeah, uh, business ethics. Well, there you have to decide, my friend. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this joke uh, came true uh, a couple of decades uh, later at the famous London uh, School of Economics, the LSE. It was offered a chair for business ethics for free. And they denied with the argument they didn't see what the one thing would have to do with the other. This is true. It's not a joke. And uh, this separation of uh, economics and ethics and feelings and democracy and nature 
uh, all economic values come in the, in the last consequence out of nature. Every single economic value. So the logical consequence would be to integrate the ecosystems both in the economic thought and in the real uh, cost calculation and success measurement in business. Huh? Because uh, if you just know if this economic activity produces a financial profit, do we know the consequences of this economic activity on its groundings, on the ecosystems? We will have no idea. So it's a very incomplete way to calculate the costs in the economy and to measure the success. And maybe um, the climax of this, impover of, of this impoverishing thought of economics is to regard uh, finance, the money and the capital, as the goal of the economy. Uh, in a holistic approach, we just regard it as a means. It's an important uh, distinction. And the goal, in our view, shall be the common good. This was first just an intuition. But then we cross-checked this intuition with constitutions of democratic countries. And there we found the same, the very same. First example, the Bavarian Constitution, it says crystal clear which shall be the goal of the economic activity. Here is the German fundamental law, property obliges and it shall serve the common good. Take this for VW, for instance. If this is the mandate of the Constitution, then we ask why are properties, what are properties, companies, private companies, public pro uh, companies, not obliged to present a common good balance sheet that we can check if they serve the common good and if they fulfill the constitutional will. These constitutions do not say that capital is a bad thing. They just say that capital is not the goal. It's a means. And this is a very important distinction. Actually, our analysis is that we're mixing up goal and means. And today, the increase of capital has become the uh, overall goal of the economic activity. Although in all other countries, uh, as a matter of course, but even in Occident, uh, philosophers have always told us the exact uh, contrary. Aristotle, in some faculties of economics, is not taught as he is, was not an economist. <laughs> what a pity. He couldn't be one. Uh, but he very uh, clearly um, distinguished between two types of the economy. First, oikonomia, money is just a means to achieve the goal of the economy, which he defined as the good life, a synonym of the common good. But if the strive for profit or for money gain would turn into the purpose of my business, then he regarded this literally as insane and uh, named it krematistike. And krematistika is a perfect synonym for capitalism. Capitalism, as the word already said, uh, be aware of any ism. Capital in the capitalism, the goal uh, of this type of economy is to increase the capital. And everything else is a possible side effect, but not a necessary side effect, or even only an instrument to achieve the goal, which is to increase capital. And oikonomia is a perfect synonym for the economy for the common good. Common good is the goal, and capital is only a means. I try to give you uh, another picture for that, that you can remember it more easily. It's like this. Today, the economy is on its head, and we have the free decision to put it back on its feet. Because sometimes they say, a picture says more than 1,000 words. So if you think this is just... <laughs> You might deem this little play as sophisticated, but if you take it really seriously, it has radical consequences at the moment of measuring success in the economy. Today, we used to measure success in the economy on all levels alongside monetary indicators, GDP, financial profit, return on investment. The unit of measurement is money in all three parameters of success, me success measurement. Uh, but uh, money is only the means. So we deem this as a failure of method. 
because success always has to be measured alongside the achievement of the goal and not alongside the accumulation of means. You might consider this practice as correct and argue that constitutions are wrong. Constitutions are mis misled. And that's why we propose the movement for an economy for the common good. Well, uh, let's clarify this confusion and let the sovereign citizens decide. And if the sovereign citizens decide that the goal of the economy shall be the accumulation of capital, well, then we can continue with this practice, but we ought to change our constitutions. If, on the contrary, uh, people agree with the constitutions, then we ought to change the way we measure success in the economy and put in line success measurement with the goal of the economy that is in the constitutions and this is democratically confirmed by the citizens. Good messages. Some first common good products already exist. The OECD has developed the Better Life Index. The London-based New Economics Foundation has created the Happy Planet Index. And also about happiness, the tiny state of Bhutan has created the Gross National Happiness. What are they doing? They're asking regularly thousands of households on all aspects of life quality. How are you? How is your physical and mental health? Will your children be once better off than you? Can you trust your neighbors or the next person that comes along the street? How are the animals, the trees in the wood, the fish in the river? Can you take a bath in the river without a health, a health risk? Can you drink the water of the river, of the cum, without a health risk? The common good product will measure what really counts. And our proposal is not to make copy and paste from the OECD or the Bhutan, but that the sovereign citizens gather in their municipalities where they live and compose in a democratic process of a whole year the 20 most relevant ingredients of life quality. And this will be the common good product. And if the common good product rises, we will know for sure that we are better off. And there will be a second reliable relationship between the success of a single company and the success of the whole society. Today, we cannot be sure about this relationship because today it's, today it's possible that a company is financially profitable and at the same time is doing good to everybody and every being. This is perfectly possible. But equally, it's possible that a company has a huge financial profit and at the same time lays off thousands of persons, increases the work pressure, leading to burnout and mobbing, boosts inequality, discriminates against women, undermines democracy and destroys nature. It's perfectly possible. In the economy for the common good, a company can only be successful if it at the same time makes the society more successful. But how? Well, putting a common good balance sheet in front of the financial balance sheet. What does the common good balance sheet do? You see the horizontal orange line fundamental values from human dignity, over solidarity, sustainability, justice and democracy. These values are not new. They are the most frequent constitutional values in democratic countries. So again, economy for the common good does not propose anything new. The only proposal is to take the goals and values of democratic constitutions seriously and integrate them reliably and coherently into the economic order. And the idea is that in the first stage, this balance sheet measures to which degree a company lifts and promotes these values towards all its stakeholders. And to make this result visible and distinguishable on all products and services. And then in the first stage, every product that we are considered to buy will tell us transparently who made it, under which conditions, with which ecological impact or footprint, if the company is a solidary or a cannibalistic one, if it pays a fair tax share or hides profits in tax havens. Consumers will have a better informed and, they have, and thus freer choice. In the second step, we propose to invert 
this misguiding relationship of prices between ethical products, which today are more expensive than less ethical products, which gives a clear competitive advantage to unethical products and in all modesty uh, makes an unethical market economy today. In an ethical market economy, this would be the other way around and ethical products would be cheaper than unethical ones. Can we do this? Of course, if we design markets intelligently, intelligently and link the common good balance sheet result to a differentiated legal treatment from taxes over tariffs, loan conditions, till public procurement priority for the most ethical uh, products. As a consequence, the ethical products will become cheaper than the less ethical ones and only responsible companies will be able to survive in then fully ethical and truly free markets. Or in other terms, the market laws, which very importantly are not natural laws, will be in coherence with the values of our constitutions and society. Well, so much for the model in 20 minutes. Um, the model is much more complete. It consists of 20 cornerstones, uh, too many for this short talk. So I would like to go uh, on to the process in these last uh, five minutes. I already mentioned that at this uh, stage of the of development of our democracies, we do not see that governments and parliaments are ready for deep and systemic change, which is desired by the majority of citizens uh, over the world. So our proposal is to let the sovereign citizens decide directly. The principle of sovereignty is at the heart of our democracies. And literally, it comes from the Latin term superanus, and means to stand above all. Somehow we know this intuitively, we know that the people stand above all in a democracy. My question is if we feel it. Did you ever feel this in every cell of your body, that the people are above all, above the constitution, above the parliament, above the government, and above every single law? Did you ever feel that? And did you ever think what, what consequences would that have? This would have radical consequences again. People, sovereign citizens, bless you, would enjoy a long series of very strong and material sovereign rights. The same way in the monarchy, the sovereign instance, the king or the queen, enjoyed in her or his time a long series of sovereign rights. You can look them up, maybe you know them. But in modern democracies, the sovereign citizens only have individual political fundamental rights, which is a great success, a great achievement, but we do not enjoy collective sovereign rights, like for instance, elect or revoke a government, like for instance, pass a law proposition by the parliament or pass an own law, like for instance, mandate the negotiation of an international agreement or vote on the negotiated outcome for the TTIP, just for instance. The first and foremost sovereign right would be the exclusive right to redact, adopt, and change the constitution. But who, if not the highest instance, shall decide what is and stands in the highest document of a democracy? Why shall it be written by the representatives of the sovereign citizens? If the people write the constitution, they would first regulate the power of their representatives, parliament and government, and secondly, they could outline the cornerstones of every policy field, like for instance, the economy, financial system, education system, or environmental policy. If the people wrote the constitution, I'm fully convinced after 25 years of political work, they would never allow banks that are too big to fail or jail, free movement of capital in tax havens, unlimited inequality, or patents on living organisms, just to name a view. And if the people wrote the constitution, they would, and we have surveys that prove it already, put the common good at the heart of the economy, oblige all banks and companies to present their common good balance sheet, 
and reward high ethical achievements and, if you want so, constitutional fidelity in ethical terms. Why I'm so sure about that? Because we also have developed a, a game which I have played with tens of thousands of citizens in more than 25 countries. And this game is called Sovereign Democracy. And this game allows to decide between a bunch of alternatives. And it allows to decide in a few minutes on the seemingly most difficult questions in politics. I think I do not have the time today to play this game with you because it would take five minutes. And I just uh, tell you the result of that game in 95% of all cases. These are negative feedback mechanisms which uh, prevent the over-concentration of wealth and power in, uh, in four terms in order to safeguard a truly liberal market economy with same rights, same liberties and same opportunities for all. And if we ask people how they would decide, the first one, on the limitation of inequality and allow them to make first their proposals on the left side, so how many times, with how many times, the legal minimum wage, you would limit the maximum income if you could decide it. In 95%, the proposal that not more than 10 times the legal minimum wage uh, is the winner. You find in the red lines the votes of resistance. Maybe I, I explain it later on. I now, I now just report you the result. And the least resistance, and as a consequence, the winner, is almost everywhere from Finland to Argentine, factor 10. Even here, I played it two times ago in London, and the result was, again, factor 10 was the winner. And compare the will of the sovereign citizens with the decision of, of their representatives in three different countries. The difference is extreme. This is extreme. And this is just one example why, and I have many more, why we deem it better that the sovereign citizens decide on the, f on the constitutional fundament of the economy, and then our dear representatives in the parliaments, which remain the legislative power, uh, make laws according to and obeying the constitution made by the sovereign citizens. The very last minute I <coughs> use to just show you some pictures of the movement, because as I already mentioned, uh, five years ago, we started with a dozen of pioneer companies, small and medium entrepreneurs in Austria. And since then, they became 1,900 in more than 40 countries. And 300 of them have made the fin the, not only the financial, but also the ethical, the common good balance sheet until the final stage. There are three banks among them. And as Clemens already mentioned, we brought a medium-sized family-owned company with 1,500 employees into the Financial Times. And this is the first public company, a university, which made their balance sheet and appointed a common good officer. And there have been created 17 legal associations in many countries, from Austria to Chile. And we are already, this is the start of the movement in UK, and we are already cooperating with municipalities and regions. I don't know if this is clear enough that you can read the upper, the upper board says municipality for the common good. This is in Spain. And in Italy, the regional parliament of Alto Adice uh, responded to four municipalities that formed the first common good region uh, with the enhancement of good common, common good balance sheet results of companies in the public procurement and the enhancement of these municipalities in the regional development policy. And very recently, we celebrated our first and uh, so far biggest success on the European level. It was my friend uh, Diego Isabel, who is in this hall. Hi, Diego. Uh, who brought us to the, he lives at London at this moment, that's why. Um, and we um, managed to, um, that the European Economic and Social Committee, which is a 350 members body um, that is representing employers, employee, um, consumer protection, farmers, and social organizations, 
uh, that can um, push the commission to initiate a law on something with opinions. And they made an opinion on the economy for the common good. And this opinion, which takes um, nine months to be uh, drafted and until the final draft, was voted on in September. And guess what was the result? An incredible 86% of the members voted in favor of the economy for the common good and asked the Commission to include it into the legal framework both of the European Union and its member states. And the next steps are already done. We were invited to European Parliament for the first time and the second and the third events are already scheduled. And this is our strategy, the last slide already. Uh, every individual uh, can participate creating a local group or joining the nearest. Every company can do the balance sheet. Every municipality can uh, become a municipality for the common good and start a citizen participation process. And every university can contribute with public dissemination, with teaching the Valencia University will create a chair for economy for the <coughs> common good. 110 years after the creation of the first chair for economics at Cambridge. And uh, it's not only Mr. Stefan Essel, but many others who invite you as persons and citizens warmly to join this movement and not only to get to know the model. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, dear friends. Let me let me jump directly into into the middle of the the matter. Uh, I, I rather do, uh, unlike Christian, who's practical. I'm a pure theory. I, I I I do philosophy of economics, and the religion of economics, and that sort. So I welcome whenever there's somebody who's actually redheaded who actually comes up with um, practical suggestions. But let me let me as a sort of a um, um, pre-clause to what, have been, what was said, um, there is this imminent belief that we have and that people have about economics, that it is a value-free, void, technical, mathematical realm of an analysis where uh, moral values need be artificially implanted. So the image we have is that there is a structure, bone-like structure, which functions somehow, the economy functions, but it lacks what some people call the soul or the spirit, which is actually quite interesting because there is certain spirit of the economy. We economists are not naturally born, nor are we allowed. It seems a little bit kinky when an economist speaks speak about the spirits. But then again, we do all the time. Uh, John Maynard Keynes came up with a very uh, famous concept of animal spirits. And every single book that I've read that elaborates this concept focuses on the animal aspect and all of the books overlook the fact that Keynes is primarily speaking of spirits whether animal or blue or yellow or, or whatever animal is a descriptor of the spirit but it mainly is a spirit so you can see that there is this sort of pretense we economists um, don't believe in spirits nor are we allowed to talk about them but in fact we talk about them um, all the time it's very similar with ethics, but we need to realize that there is no such thing as a neutral ideological ground, which economics, um, uh, it's a mainstream economics, pretends to be. So, so this thing that with which very many business people or even economists dismiss notions like this, very often in silence, by the way, by, by completely ignoring the whole thing, is no, 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 this is artificial. What we are representing here is something real, natural, human. Uh, aut automatic. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's a point number one. Point number two, 
uh, the situation isn't as easy as if there is an uh, ethical vacuum in the middle of the economy. That would be a, an easier situation. That's the more optimistic way of looking at it. The fact is um, that there is a very strong ethical body within the very textbooks that uh, we teach at economic schools. Um, so the, the pretense is it's a technical, physics-like uh, science, even. Uh, but in fact, it's a form of, you could even go and say, a for, for new form of new ethics, call it ecumenic ethics, or whatever we'd like to say. Let me just briefly mention some of the big values, ethical values, of current economics. I'll mention the negative one first, then I'll come to the more positive ones. So for example, egoism. Uh, what we do uh, as economists, we hide the value judgment into the is. So human beings is egoistic. We no longer debate whether that statement is valid or not, even though this was a big topic of philosophy or moral philosophy ever since philosophy was invented. We've assumed it away, and not only did we assume it away, that would sort of be okay, we started believing our assumptions, which I think is, um, uh, is, is uh, a wonderful case of showing how we economists started believing the very mythology that we created. <coughs> Egoism is a big value. You not only should not think about whether you should or shouldn't be egoistic, you are egoistic. Secondly, uh, profit is a huge value by profit uh, or, or rational behavior. Now, please mark that when it comes to a company, rational behavior is automatically equated with profit maximization behavior, which I don't know where we took that from. You can have a perfectly rational company, which doesn't really necessarily have to mean, or in many cases it doesn't mean, that it's actually profit maximizing. Behavior of companies actually denies this completely. Um, as you see in, in, in gift giving and loyalty cards and all, all sorts of things like that. Don't care for the results of your deeds. This is another way of translating the meaning of the invisible hand of the markets. Follow your own utility, follow your own interest, and it is your moral duty not to care what it does to the society. There is another paradox here if you, if you dive a little bit more into Adam Smith's argumentation about the origins of the invisible hand of the market where the argumentation for egoism is actually altruistic. I don't know whether you've noticed this or not. But if human beings were truly egoistic, it would suffice for Adam Smith to say that uh, the butcher uh, sells you the meat because he follows his own interest, period. Because that is an argumentation that is good enough for an egoist. But this isn't good enough for real people. That's why Adam Smith has to add, and thus help the common good. So Adam Smith here, just to you know, repeat that point again, because I think it's an important point. Adam Smith actually uses altruistic or common good argumentation, but it is commonly uh, understood that he actually advocates um, egoism. Um, yeah, there is, uh, there is, okay, there are also positive values that we have in economics. Freedom of actors, for example, that is a value that I largely agree with. Um, but it's a value, nevertheless. Uh, there, we believe in responsibility, we believe in prudence, um, and all these other values that, um, that uh, we buy as we read economic textbooks. This is, this is the, you could also turn it into a joke. Paul, Paul Samuelson, who wrote, of course, the book called Economics, um, promises in the introduction, and this book was taught for 50 years and in some universities is still taught, and the new books are not so much different from, from, from what Paul Samuelson wrote, but the prologamina the, the prolog to the book says, I want you to teach you to think like an economist. This is a very famous, famous sort of a line that you've um, read many times, but I remember even as a student, I had the advantage of studying economics twice, once in Denmark and the second time in Czech Republic. So I had a little bit of uh, two years of sort of somewhat of repetition. So when I was reading the, 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 the text, I was thinking, okay, but which one? 
which economists do you have in mind? Would it be uh, Adam Smith with huge emphasis on morals? Or do you mean Friedrich von Hayek? Or do you mean John Stuart Mill? Or you mean Keynes? Or do you mean Milton Friedman? Or do you mean, uh, I don't know, Veblen? Or do you mean Marx? Or was Marx not an economist? Where is the, you know, which, uh, which one? And the, argue, the, 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 sort of the, the silent answer I very often get, oh, no, no, you don't understand. What, what, Krugman, what uh, Samuelson here is trying to do is to show you a common ground that these people would have. Absolutely not. If you put all these people together in one room, one thing I'm quite sure they would never agree on would be Samuelson's textbook. I mean, in none of these great thinkers' notion, economics should be taught like this. The great Marshall that taught here, I don't know if you know this, he wrote this very beautiful, beautiful line about burning the mathematics, uh, saying that if you can't explain it, uh, if, you need a mo if you can't explain it in English, create a model. If the model works, burn the mathematics. If it doesn't make any sense, throw the model out. If it doesn't make sense without mathematics. Because what we economists very often do is we create the scaffolding and we pretend that that's the building. If you take our assumptions, assumptions were there to help us build the building, but in fact we build the scaffolding only. You take the assumptions away, the whole thing crumbles. Okay, let me, so, so that's, that's my second point. Economics has strong moral uh, teaching that we teach to the students and to the world, but we are denying it and we are, uh, it's, it's what I would call normative backwards. You cannot be normative towards economics as a field. It will give you values. You can't give your values to it. That's perverse. It will give values to you. So it may appear positivistic, but in fact it's normative backwards. You don't have this in physics. Now, let me, let me um, just a little bit try to show how these values that we feel are natural. By the way, there's nothing natural about the way markets work today, like there is nothing natural about democracy. Now, saying that there is nothing natural about democracy doesn't mean that democracy is foul, but it is not God-given system, just like it, just like Capitalism isn't. What I mean by that, if you take a look in the history of just Europe to start with, democracy you will find in extreme minority of time space continuum. A couple of villages in the antique Greek were democratic, then nothing for thousands of years, and now in the past 200 years, some countries sometimes interrupted by two wars. And it was actually very close, and it is good that we are here in the United Kingdom's land to, to, to thank you guys. But very little was missing, and the continental Europe was either Nazi or communist. Very, very little was, was missing. Um, if you let, by that, I mean that if you let go of steering wheel, democracy is not where the car will park. In other words, you have to care and nurture your democracy, change it constantly, and also understand that the, that the nature of democracy is not in the laws, but in the spirit of democracy. If you all voted that all redheads, I think there's three of us, including the lady there. Um, if you would all vote here that all redheads should be killed because by some statistics we are more, I don't know what, different, irrational, irrational or yeah, we are more aggressive, for example, or more charming. <laughs> Same thing, and the rest of the society would get extremely jealous. It would, would it be, that's a good question, would it be a democratic decision if you all, 90% of you voted that redheads should be executed? Is that a democratic decision? It is? Uh, no, it isn't. The basic principle of democracy is protection of minorities. So it's technically, you can vote for it, but if you do it, you breach the spirit of democracy. So there is a very sort of taint discretion um, uh, uh, taint difference in this. Same applies. So, in other words, let me put it in another way. You have two countries, exactly the same laws of democracy and of market. In one country, country A, there is culture of democracy and culture of markets. In another country, country B, same laws, no culture of democracy, 
no culture of markets. Place A will be a nice place to live in, place B can be hell on earth. That's perhaps a better way of, um, of saying it. So, um, yeah, now, my next point is how, this, uh, how these values get so nicely smuggled into the, what I call social science fiction of uh, economics, if, if, if you may. Uh, I'm going to turn this into a little bit of a joke, uh, but it is actually quite serious. In the morning, two economists meet and they say, what shall we do? Well, you know, let, they, of course they meet in the laboratory because it sounds, you know, scientific. Um, uh, never seen an economic laboratory properly, but yeah, let's just pretend. And they say, what shall we do today? And he said, oh, I don't know, let's make a model. Okay, how shall we start? Well, in physics, they always start with assumptions. Let's start with assumptions. Then. Let's, what shall we assume today? Well, let's assume that human beings like to wear yellow socks. It's a technical assumption, I can assume anything. In physics, they assume that the fraction of air doesn't exist when they calculate the speed of the free fall. That's a stupid assumption, but it works. So why not? Of course, everybody knows friction of air exists and it has influence, but the trick, and this is the basic method of science, we trick reality. We can't see our results directly. We don't see the equ equations, like Neo sees the matrix behind uh, reality. We don't see that. We, uh, we, see, we, we don't see the, the truth behind the real. So what we do is we trick the nature, we become tricksters, and we play these as-if games. Yeah? So it's very difficult to calculate the, the fall of an object, but it's really easy if we pretend for a little while that the friction of air doesn't exist. Of course it does, but it's a, it's a game, it's a pretense. So yeah, so these, um, these uh, um, uh, economists say, what you, let's assume that, yeah, I don't know, yellow socks or that people like to jump on their left, like whatever you want. Free from, this is a free arena to roam. And then one of them says, well, let's assume that human beings are rational. Well, that sounds like a rational assumption. And uh, let's do our calculation and see what comes out. So far, no problem. These are fully technical assumptions, and you can assume anything you like. The problem becomes later when these two friends walk into the bar or into the pub and start telling their friends, you know what we discovered today? We discovered that human beings are egoistic. Why? Well, because the math works better. That's just like if the two physicists would come to the same pub and say, you know what we discovered today? That friction of air doesn't exist. So in the morning, it was a technical assumption, which is fine. It was a scaffolding. In the evening, it was an article of faith. So you will see economists running around trying to convince the world that human beings actually are egoistic or rational or whatever their assumptions um, require them to believe. So what Christian is trying to do here is not some uh, artificial injecting of economics with something that it doesn't have, but it's an attempt to replace values that economics has, it never speaks about them. It's, a, it's even, a, you, could even, you can even think of economics as a new religion, but its basic fundaments have never been discussed, just like in the church. Um, <clears throat> now, it's also quite possible uh, that we are living in a situation of a veining fetish. We fetishize economics, every generation has something else, the genius of European integration was that the Founding Fathers swapped a fetish of national growth geographically, which we for some reason had, our forefathers had it half a century ago. They swapped that fetish for a fetish of a national growth economically. Now that fetish of a national growth economically is of course much safer and much less aggressive fetish than the ge uh, geographical one, but it still is quite aggressive. Now, for example, uh, you can see this nicely in the very term credit crunch. Credo in Latin, we went through a little bit of Greek, so we can also go through a little bit of Latin. Credo in Latin means faith. So it's a faith crunch. What we are experiencing since 2007, 2008, ever since the name came into being, is a um, uh, uh, faith crunch. We no longer can afford to believe things we readily believed before the crisis. So it's a little bit like a situation of a Catholic church during the Re Reformation period, but we still don't have the Luther. People no longer want to believe it, but we have nothing that we can reliably believe, 
So we are still, it's like a little bit like, like, like um, you see this in the cartoons very often. There is an edge of a rock and an animal is running across the edge and it keeps running because it doesn't realize that the, that the ground to support him is lacking and he only falls or it only falls when it looks down and realizes that the solid rock is in fact, um, um, uh, it's, it's, in, it's in fact gone. So um, um <clears throat> another way, uh, let me, let me, another way how to demonstrate how economists are active creators of ideology and active creators of, 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 of propagating certain ethical standards which they don't even admit that they do is this debate on GDP and I will end with this so that we can have, we can have more time for uh, debate. Uh, this is not a good audience to ask because you're students, but I've asked about 3,000, I also do little surveys. Yesterday was my last one in, in Hamburg where I asked 250 business people from the consulting world of McKinsey and bankers and financial people, people of money, people who deal with money. I asked them, um, does any one of you know about whether your personal GDP went up or down 2014 to 2015 quarter to quarter? By personal GDP I mean your income. Does anybody of you know? And by knowing, I mean, do you know exactly? And I wanted to the decimal point of a percentage. And there's always three people who sort of wave their hand and they say, yeah, I know it went up. I said, yeah, yeah, but, but how much do you know? Yeah, about, I said, I don't want about. I can't answer when they ask me in the media well, how much GDP will rise next year. I can't say, well, about, you know, something between minus 10 and plus 10. Let's cut the long story short. Not one of these people would be able to, was able to say, I know exactly my income went, I don't know, up by 4.2% last year. None of them knew this. None of them keeps graphs and none of them keeps statistics of how their income actually went. So what's my point? My point is, <clears throat> why don't you care about your personal GDP and why are you ready to dismantle the European Union because some abstract GDP of Germany or of the United Kingdom that has almost no correlation to your income or the income of your company? Where does the magic happen that it doesn't matter to you when it's your income? You don't calculate it, you don't count it, you don't publicize it, you don't put it in a graph. And then some magic happens and it becomes a fetishized number for which we are ready to do whatever uh, the markets require, whatever sacrifice the markets require we are ready to do. Second question is a methodological question. Uh, and I always ask this, don't you know, why don't we know the level of our personal income? Why don't we know? Is it difficult methodologically to find out whether it went up or down like it is with GDP? And here you're absolutely right. It, it was never meant to measure, by the way, happiness. It was meant to measure economic activity, which is two completely different um, aspects. But no, of course, you just call your accountant and you ask him, what was your level of income? And of course, there, here is a strong assumption that the level of your income somewhat is reflected in your tax returns. But, um, and you divide the two numbers by each other and you multiply it by 100 and you get your percentage. That's a five-minute exercise, not even. Why don't you know? Well, you, we don't know these things, not because it's difficult to know. We don't know these things because we do not care. So for personal GDP, even the people of money who should be doing this on, on, on a weekly basis, they don't care, and then it becomes a fetishized sort of a GDP that, um, that, um, um, uh, that uh, yeah is able to destroy whatever we've been trying to work. Now, uh, <clears throat> let me just conclude by saying that um, <clears throat> capitalism changes. It's, uh, it's, it's a system which I uh, very much wanted to have when we had a revolution in 1989. Uh, no alternatives that were tried in history, uh, now meaning Nazism or, or communism, uh, could even loosely uh, compare, uh, but um, <clears throat> uh, the point here is that we, uh, capitalism 20 years ago looked completely different than it looks today. 20 years ago we didn't know anything about ecology. 
20 years ago, ecology was a couple of extremists hanging from the whales and screaming things at people that nobody really understood, and we thought that they were weirdos. 20 years down the road, a green thinking has become a very serious political force, very serious business force, and even very serious personal force. I mean, we do separate uh, the cans, even we're not sure whether they actually don't put it on back on the same pile. But it, you would not wash a car in a river today. 20 years ago, it was absolutely normal to do that because nobody knew the consequences of their deeds and nobody cared for the consequences of their deeds, where they thought that nature has this in amazing capacity of um, uh, the invisible hand of self-coordinating mechanism. So you can see that this effort of, of, of the green movement, while far from done, was really quite successful and that capitalism in, um, incorporated it that quite well. I was lying, one last thought, I will surprise you, I believe in the invisible hand, but not of the market, but of the society. The society has, that's why we're here, the society has some way of coordinating itself. If the nation becomes too bureaucratic, Kafka will be born. If the nation becomes too cooperative, a generation of hippies will follow. Uh, sometimes it is so that uh, politics is saved by businesses. Sometimes it is so that the uh, politics is saved by art. This is what happened in 1989. Uh, it was the artists, Havel and others, at least in my country, who saved the situation and, and, and made a revolution in a way. Sometimes um, uh, the economy is saved by the body of politics, which is exactly what happened in 2007 and 2008. This is why there was so much hatred against bankers, because we were Pharisees. We didn't believe what we believed. Because on Friday it was, let us be, don't meddle, we clever, you stupid. This is businesses talking to, to, to politicians or bureaucrats. And the next day something happened and the same you know, Wall Street boys were begging on the very same door of the government saying, please meddle. You clever, we stupid. We don't have a clue. Till today, we don't have a clue what to do. Take all the advice that you get from all the think tanks like IMF and World Bank, I don't know what, basically says, be more like Japan. Be more technological, be more focused on uh, economics, be more hard studying, study harder. Da -di -da -di -da -di -da. Commit suicides if you, if you get laid uh, off. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to use that more often. I actually came out. Yeah, laid off. <clears throat> of course, the running joke is even if we Europeans would be as effective and as technological and as high speed trained and as uh, uh, education sort of oriented as Japan, we, we would not grow. So uh, I take this as an uh, 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 invisible hand of the society from the area of, of art, namely dancing, that uh, could substitute for this fach idiotenship which we have developed in this autistic thinking which we have developed in economics. In the old days, it was the belief that the business of breweries is to sell beer. This seems unattackably reasonable and, and, and logical. I think uh, uh, what we realize more and more often that the business of breweries is to harvest beer culture. And that is a completely different concept and their cooperation becomes much more important because you don't want to destroy the very field that you're harvesting. Thank you very much. Um, there is time for questions, and um, we are um, very much looking forward to what happens um, from uh, you, the audience. Um, I uh, would like to remind you once again briefly um, to keep them uh, short and precise so that um, we can get answers from all our speakers. Um, but obviously, feel free to address questions to any single speaker you'd like to invite. Uh, yeah, we have a question at the very back. Um, how important do you think the sustainable development goals that Germany is currently working on are in terms of economy, like in terms of change of lifestyle, etc.? Well, I would like to give two answers. Uh, first answer, on the level of international politics, they're not taking them seriously. What do I mean with this? Um, if they took them seriously, that would make them as a condition for trade. At the moment, the TTIP, the Unfree Trade 
agreement between the US and the European Union um, wants to set new global standards in order that, that this gold standard of a trade agreement can be implemented to the whole world. But uh, human rights implementation is not a condition. Working rights uh, uh, implementation is not a condition. Climate change, uh, uh, climate change protection is not a condition. Uh, sustainable development goals are not a condition and anything else that is already agreed on in the core of the international law in the United Nations is not a condition. And the United States uh, have not ratified the second covenant on human rights. They have not ratified six out of eight uh, core uh, labor norms. They have not ratified the Kyoto Protocol. They have not ratified international environmental agreements and not ratified uh, the UNESCO Convention on Cultural Diversity. So they are not serious about that. They are doing the exact opposite of what would be supported by a huge majority of citizens, that uh, sustainable development is a condition for trade. And to put it more precisely even, trade is not an end in itself. It's just the means. And if the means helps us to achieve our goals, to achieve the sustainable development goals, but also human rights goals, and other goals that are already agreed on in the United Nations, well then, uh, more trade is welcome. If trade, on the contrary, endangers the achievement of these goals, then we want less trade. But uh, these questions are not even questions in the TTIB ne negotiations or in the World Trade Organization, which is the multilateral forum, uh, because they put these negotiations uh, intentionally aside uh, in the autistic of uh, offshore, legal offshore uh, region of the United Nations because they do not want to have any relationship between uh, sustainability, human rights uh, on, the, on the one hand and trade on the <coughs> other hand. Second question, maybe a, a short one. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I deplore a bit that I could only um, um, tell you about one or two cornerstones of this model, but it has 20 and one cornerstone would be uh, a third generation of human rights, ecological human rights, and this uh, could work in the following way. Uh, the planet gives us a yearly uh, gift of uh, bioresources, and we could divide this yearly gift of bioresources by an individual consumption budget per capita, and we could charge this on our credit card. The credit card would be hybrid credit cards, financial and ethical credit card, or this, in this case, ecological credit card, and we can consume our yearly budget. And uh, if it's finished before the year finishes, then we get only the minimum wage, which is just uh, the, uh, the possibility to get food and shelter, but nothing more. And this would be uh, both a sustainable approach and a liberal approach. Why? Because it would give the same right to all human beings, a liberal approach. And I fully agree with your democracy example. I could deepen on it. And at the same time, it's a protection right for the planet and the whole humanity would remain within the ecological boundaries of the planet. Thank you. Anything to add? Um, do we have uh, any further questions? Um, yes, John. Thank you. So, I of course fully agree that economics, just any other area of human interaction, will have a normative dimension. The problem is that this normative dimension is something that philosophers have been discussing on for 2,500 years. Yeah. Now, economists are very welcome to join us in this discussion, but we haven't reached any very, very good results so far. It's very hard to say what a good, what an ethical decision is in any context, and in particular, of course, in, in situations that are as complicated as, as economics is as an overall system. I agree fully with the fact that something that is done by the majority that is not thereby good. So the mere fact that citizens think that a certain way of structuring, structuring economics is a better way does not make it a better way, just as it would not be a good thing to kill all red hats only because many citizens think so. So we are in a rather uncomfortable situation. And I wonder in how far this awakening of economics, this increasing the scope of economics, does not just mean that we should give all of our energy into the philosophy faculties, think about how we want to direct these things before implementing it too strongly into an existing environment. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's a brilliant question. Um, so now this is sort of my arena. What, you really got me nicely going. I say, OK, fine. If you want to be, um, do you know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Yes. There, human beings wanted to know the answer to the soft question in a hard way. They asked the computer to give them the answer to the meaning of life, universe, and everything. 
So the computer, after two million years of calculating, gave them the, the answer, 42. And this, I think, is a nice, nice answer, or, or perhaps a nice way of enlarging the scope of which we, what we do in economics, or in any science, but in economics quite, quite significantly, we pressurize the soft into the outskirts of the model, and that, only that movement allows us to make the model look exact. That's exactly why the answer 42 looks so laughable, because we, ha we don't know the context, we don't know the assumptions, we don't know the, the way how that computer got to, to 42. Answer number one. Answer number two, uh, uh, but the assumption is part of the model, sorry, that makes the model. The mathematics isn't the interesting part. What's interesting is these moral assumptions, which we sort of press away that nobody's interested. We all just want the, the 4.2 uh, answer to the question. So answer number one. Answer number two is something that, um, imagine that there is, this is a distribution problem, so for you this will be familiar ground. Let's imagine there's three people just like us, but only two, two pints of beer. How shall we distribute that beer? Should the youngest get it, or should the uh, oldest get it? <laughs> should should a lady get it? If you ask if you ask a doctor, it say, "Oh, get the thirstiest should get it." If you ask somebody who does protocol, the lady should have it. Should uh, so if we ask an economist, he would auction the two beers, and one person would probably have it. You know? so each one of those spheres uh, would give you a completely different uh, sense of justice. We do this on daily basis. You come to a, a drugstore and first come, first serve. You talk about new technology, the one who has more money uh, will serve, be served first. If you come to a doctor, the one who needs the surgery will be served first. So you have different layers. But what's my point is, we don't know how to distribute, or, distri or should the one who made the beer, who should have the two beers. The way we've been solving this, a magical third beer suddenly appears, which is, of course, my allegory on growth. So what has happened is that growth has bribed us philosophers, sociologists, and our social sciences, people who should be answering these questions, into oblivion by that. And the problem of today is, and that's why your book and other books are so timely, is that the third beer didn't appear. We are not experiencing this bribing machine called growth. Um, so that's, uh, that's the second question. Third question, uh, third answer, and I will try to be Try to, be, try to be brief here. If we want to be rigorous, I always say to my colleagues, then let's be rigorous all the way. So with every assumption, of course this is again a little bit tongue in cheek, with every assumption give it a probability. So let's imagine we take the probability, that uh, the assumption that human beings are rational, just to go through. Okay, 50-50? 60-70? It, it, get, it gets ridiculous already at this point, but my point was, okay, let's imagine we take eight assumption, assumptions, and before we even start constructing the mathematical part of the model, we will know that we are moving on an 8% probabilities world. So the answers of that model should be also taken because we have assumed our way to 8 or 10% of the real world. We shouldn't take the result of that equation as a uh, fully fledged answer. Fourth way, and here I'll be very brief, there are many values in human life. Some of them have a number, in this case price. Some of them don't. There's nothing wrong with either group. I mean, this pen is very dear to me and it has a price. I could sell it to you. <coughs> Cell phone, table, recording device, books, water. Things have value and it has a number. But we also have values in our lives that do not have a number and fundamentally never will have. What's my point? No matter how good your mathematics is, the answer that you get from calculating values will always be somewhat leaping on one leg because you'll be never able to include the full, the full, um, uh, the full uh, Monty into that. There is a movement of trying to give numbers to things that don't naturally lend themselves to numbers. This is your approach, which I fully appreciate. A for me, as of here, I become a philosopher a little bit. It would be ideal if, because you want to try to count happiness. At the end of the day, I have my answer is why do you need to count it? You don't do it in personal life, so it's going to be. But somehow, we human beings do like to fetishize numbers. So, clean air, a value without a price, becomes value with price because you put 
carbon emissions on it. But this has happened always. Trees only have price because we somehow, somehow um, got used to it. So, um, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, further questions? Uh, yes, please, at the front. I very much appreciate your points, uh, Thomas and Christian. Thank you for sharing the economy of the common good with us, as well as your economics of good and evil being instrumental to my study. So I have something a little bit evil in it, yeah? This guy is only good, but I have a sort of warm <laughs> there. <laughs> and I'd like to bring up a point, actually, in terms of the parameters of good and evil. So, for instance, the values of value. Uh, looking at, for instance, the point where there is no discussion for a traditional Muslim, looking at uh, Sharia finance, for instance, and not participating in uh, interest on their investments. Yeah. And as an investment manager today, I'm fascinated by seeing how the outworkings of the implementation of uh, Christian's economics sort of, uh, of the common good are actually going to be manifested from the banks to the smaller entrepreneurs. Um, taking another step towards the philosophical side of things on, on an economic perspective, it would be really interesting hearing from Thomas um, looking at how we lost some of the spirit which did hold together yeah. Europe in the past. Um, putting my hand up saying that my master's thesis was on tax labor and on uh, the guys' capitalism, the spirit right. of capitalism. Yeah. So the, there's another example of spirit, yeah. so spirit talk, that we economists, you know, talk about all the time. And coming to the final point of my question, you mentioned that capitalism is like the Catholic Church without Luther. What would actually help us to find uh, a Luther to rally behind? And how would that actually change economics and business? Yeah, to give us something new to believe. But do you want to start? With the bank, I, as you like. I can start with the bank and the stock market for the common good. Um, well, the, the core is that money is regarded as a, as a public good first and foremost. Uh, it's such a powerful means of the economy and the whole society that we uh, shall make the rules for the monetary system very democratically. <coughs> Um, just for instance, there would be a majority that central banks should be public ones, should be democratically composed, their organs should have the exclusive right to issue money, which is not the case today, and that uh, commercial banks should uh, be obliged to serve the common good, and that loans should only be allowed to be given to real investment, and maybe that any any investment shall not only uh, be checked on its uh, financial creditworthiness, which is a legal obligation today. All banks are obliged to, to evaluate the uh, financial creditworthiness of any loan um, appliance. Uh, and if it's, if it's not good, because uh, it is, this, this evaluation is even called a, um, a, 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 a check of bonus or malus, if it's not good, <laughs> if it's evil, uh, then the, the loan is not given. And uh, this is rational, it's had, it, 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 it has its point, but it's only about the means of the economy. The, as well as uh, lawmakers are obliging all companies to present their financial balance sheet, and if the performance indicators that are required by law are not met, then the company is in insolvency, and the free right of, uh, of enterprise is taken away. In the same way, if an appliant for a loan cannot uh, meet with the financial creditworthiness indicators, then the loan is not given. And that's not a bad thing. But if you are so rigorous on the means of the economy, then we would have been at least uh, as rigorous with the values of our so democratically decided values and goal of our constitutions. So uh, what I mean, every, every uh, loan request should also be checked on its ethical impact if it um, gives a plus values to the ecological capital, to the social capital, the cultural capital, the human capital, or a minus value. If it, gives, if it diminishes uh, the value of these other types of capital, the capital, then it's expropriating common goods. It makes us poorer. And today, if we only uh, reconsider the financial return on investment, and we consider uh, an investment with a double digit return, financial return on investment, we consider it as extraordinarily successful, although maybe it, it destroys the environment, it destroys trust, it boosts inequality, it undermines democracy, and, uh, and, and diminishes all our true uh, values. 
So the bank for the common good, on the one hand, would check all uh, loan appliances on the ethical uh, performance. The better the ethical and performance, the cheaper uh, the loan and the better the loan conditions. And if it passes the ethical creditworthiness check, but not the financial one, then the bank cannot take the risk, but it can pass over uh, this loan request or this request for, fa for, for, for financing to the regional uh, common good stock market. <laughs> means that uh, households and citizens which have an, 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 an ever-growing excess of financial wealth, which is at this moment going to the financial casino, is going to speculation, uh, creating financial bubbles which, uh, uh, which crash uh, every, every now and then. Well, a part of this uh, excessive money could go to the regional uh, uh, common good stock markets and nourish companies uh, without a financial return on investment. Um, and to which company would I give my money if I do not get uh, more means back, more money back? Well, this company would have to make extremely deep sense, uh, doing something really required, would uh, create utilities that I really need, for instance, an ethical bank, uh, where I can uh, open an account. And third, it would, ha would have to present me an excellent ethical balance sheet, but because only if it's doing good to the whole society and starting from the creation of good employment and uh, doing good to, to all stakeholders, then I would be ready to give my money without expecting a financial return investment, being it a dividend or being it an interest. Thank you for that um, uh, great answer. We didn't succeed on the short questions and short term <laughs> answers. Um, I think the questions were good. Yeah. But the I problem was with the long answers, yeah. no? <laughs> Um, I do hope the answers were interesting though, and I do hope that you enjoyed the event as a whole. Um, this was the fourth um, event of CSET this term, and you will be able to follow the event on YouTube, uh, where you will really have a photo of the for the week. Um, if you enjoyed the event and would like to find out more, do um, uh, check out our Facebook page and like us there. Um, obviously, you are know, so most welcome to share um, events and, and this one if you enjoyed it. Um, I just quickly give an, an update on what's happening next week. Um, on Wednesday, we are hosting an event um, on the question of what's wrong with modern, modern economics. Um, and we will have Professor Tony Lawson of the um, Cambridge University Economic Faculty speaking on that question. Um, and on Tuesday, uh, Paper Zero is, being, uh, is taking place on the question of um, inequality in the 21st century. Um, obviously, both of those events are free and open to students of all subjects. So please do um, uh, feel free to attend. Um, uh, let me uh, once again uh, invite us to uh, thank our speakers and I do hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you.